Everybody loves classical music. They just don't know about it. And <laughs> if people realize that, it would not be 3% of the population who loves classical music, but 100% of the population. When you hear the opening of the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven's last movement, pom pee, pee, pom 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 pee. It's a universal experience. The key, the disposition of the instruments, the whole way the tune is created makes everybody feel uplifted, and I mean everybody. As a composer, teacher, and the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra, Benjamin Zander has made his life's goal to open people's eyes to their love for classical music and its deep connection with the human experience. I'm Doug Frazier, and this is What We Do where we'll meet the people behind the most intriguing passions, hobbies, and jobs around the world. I was at the Grammys for my Bruckner Fifth recording. One of the pop singers said to me, how long is your song? And I said, about an hour and a half. And he said, oh, mine's three minutes. <laughs> the difference between a three-minute piece and a piece that lasts an hour and a half is vast. It's, it means that the classical uh, piece is exploring a huge range of different experiences, whether it's the vastness of architecture, the depth of loss, the joy of love, the turmoil of despair, you know, whatever the emotions may be, it's explored over a large arena and like a novel can draw people into that world in a most exciting and extraordinary way. Since most of us are accustomed to the quick experiences of non-classical music, sinking into a 90-minute song can feel daunting. Attention span, busy schedules, there are plenty of time-based reasons why we may avoid such marathon music. But if we search deeper, the hurdle is less about time and more about understanding its language. When I hear a classical piece, um, I feel sort of like a jolt in my skin, this, a sharpening of my emotions. What am I experiencing? Wow, that's, um, that's a big question. The, the musical language, and it is a language, functions in a totally different way than a verbal language. The verbal language is an intellectual thing. We have associations with words and their meanings and we put together the sense of somebody's spoken word through our brain. The music doesn't speak through that same channel. It speaks, and this may sound a little weird, it speaks through our molecules, it speaks through the emotions. And the clear evidence of that is that a single phrase of music can conjure up a memory or a sad experience or a joyful one. The reason that bands play marches is in order to encourage the soldiers to be brave and go out and kill the enemy. And it's an, it, it isn't as if some people feel the energy and joy and courage of the music and some people don't. Everybody feels it, which is why all the soldiers become brave when they hear a march and all the mourners at a funeral become sad when they hear the funeral music. So it's a universal language in a true sense, unlike any other language that human beings have devised, because it doesn't uh, depend on the intellectual process that our verbal languages depend on. Still, for many of us, classical music can feel out of reach. Like Shakespeare or the works of Impressionist painters, we might feel at once a connection and a distance. The thing that keeps people away from classical music is that they are intimidated by it. They feel it's something for rich people or for educated people or for grown-up people or they don't find it natural to join. 
So what I've done, and I hope other people will do it too, I take every opportunity to explain what the music is about. My recordings all have a disc that go with it, that explain the music to the lay audience so that they understand. Before every com every concert, I give a talk to the audience about what the music is about, what to listen for, what it's, what the story is, what the background is. And in my classes, that's what I do too. So I've become very clear that Everybody loves classical music and will love to listen to it, but only if they're given some help. And the more you listen and the more you're guided in listening, the richer it becomes. And we want, of course, like with good food or anything, any other wonderful thing in life, beautiful nature scenes or whatever it may be, we want the best for people. We want people to experience life most fully. When Ben was 45, he had a life-changing realization. At that point, he'd been conducting for over two decades. One day it hit him, the conductor doesn't make a sound. To create music, he depends fully on the orchestra. It's a point he discusses in his viral TED Talk, which has been viewed over 13 million times. I realized my job was to awaken possibility in other people. And of course, I wanted to know whether I was doing that. And you know how you find out? You look at their eyes. If their eyes are shining, you know you're doing it. If the eyes are not shining, you get to ask a question. And this is the question. Who am I being that my player's eyes are not shining? We can do that with our children too. Who am I being that my children's eyes are not shining? That's a totally different world. How would you describe your teaching style? Energetic, passionate, intrusive, very, very engaged, loving, um, and with a huge amount of optimism and conviction that the other person that I'm teaching is capable of realizing whatever I'm dreaming. I always say that, that the leader's job is to create a vision and, and never doubt for a moment the capacity of the people he's leading to realize whatever he's dreaming, the ideal, the possibility of the music that we're exploring and attempting to bring into the world. And my energy, which is, seems to be unusually generous, I think, my energy is, is very generous. It doesn't give up easily. Mm. And that, I think, gives young people a lot of courage and a lot of um, conviction because optimism is a very, very powerful force. And I don't allow uh, that negative voice to dominate. You say, I can't do it. Other people are better. It's not worth it. I'll never make it. You know, that whole uh, um, drama scenario which people carry in their heads, particularly young people, but I think it's true of older people too. I have a lot of strategies to quieten that voice and to enable people to get in touch with their job, which is to project this music into the world. One of Ben's strategies is to draw the musician close to the audience. Seeing their reactions as the music from their instrument creates an experience for the listeners, the musician is able to see firsthand the beauty of what they're doing giving a gift to the people who have come to hear them play. It's a contribution to the lives of those sitting in their seats, welcoming the emotions drawn up from the sounds of the instruments. That takes away the voice that says, I can't do it. The I, the ego, is dissipates, it disappears if your main attention is on the contribution you're making. And so I've made a shift in my own life and I pass it on to others from success and failure, from winning and losing, from the downward spiral where fear, anxiety, pressure, 
and rather move into this arena, which we call radiating possibility, where the purpose is contribution. I love that philosophy. And it's, it's so simple. It's actually very, very simple. And it takes the attention away from one's own concerns. Am I good enough? Are people better? Am I ready? Have I practiced enough? Do other people play better? All those voices that come into the head, they are designed by the enemy. And the enemy is to undermine the true purpose of human beings, which is to communicate and contribute. And so if you can intercept that enemy and focus with absolute attention on this notion of contribution, the pathway becomes free. And music is a wonderful uh, vehicle for that. You find that's the most natural form of expression for human beings. The possibilities of expression through classical music are endless. But there's a catch. You cannot play great music until your heart has been broken. Ben first heard this as a young cellist and passes down this wisdom to his own players. Just before a concert in Venezuela, one of Ben's musicians approached him backstage. And said, I've got some good news. I said, what? He said, my fiancé just left me. <laughs> right. And you see, your laughter is delightful because you suddenly realize that this young man had got access to a wisdom that had not been available until I had de delivered this message, that it's only when you experience deep sorrow, sadness, loss, that you can get access to the greatest music. The young player took his seat on stage and raised his instrument. With the wave of Ben's baton, the musician opened his broken heart to the audience. If we can, as parents, for instance, particularly, and teachers, if we can focus all our attention on what makes the person in our charge, whether it's a child or somebody in a class or in an orchestra or in a business, that they are feeling energized and full of possibility. And if something terrible happens or you make a terrible mistake, you throw your hands up in the air, how fascinating. And then you learn something from it and go on to find the next possibility. And if we were really disciplined in this, we would greet everything that happens as a possibility. When you create that world of possibility for others, you find yourself surrounded with Ben's favorite thing, shining eyes. I would guess that the people listening to our conversation have shining eyes. And, and I know how to get those shining eyes, which is to focus on this approach to life, which creates connection and in, in inclusion and love and energy and participation and, and contribution, above all, contribution. To realize our own possibility to connect and contribute in this world, we have to help those around us recognize their own possibility. It's a philosophy of giving that's brought Ben endless joy and just might hold the key to opening something greater within us all. And while you're doing it, why not throw on some Mozart? If Ben's theory that everyone loves classical music is right, then chances are, like me, you have some catching up to do. And my life is really about spreading that news that, that this music has such extraordinary power and such richness and such capacity 
to enable us to live our lives more fully. And it's a thrilling idea when you think of it. And so when I get up in the morning each day, I'm thrilled by this excitement. I'm like it. Ben, thanks again so much for your time. Wonderful, Doug. It is a great pleasure to talk with you. And your eyes are shining. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, thanks so much for listening. Would you mind leaving a rating and review for the show? It only takes a moment and it's a huge help. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes. Until next time, stay curious. What We Do is produced by me, Doug Frazier, for WHRO Public Media.